Ezekiel chapter 47 verses 1 through 12 is our text. I would point you to the fact, or to remind you for later, um, Isaiah 66 and Mark 9 both providentially will be texts that I will not refer to, but we read that um, you can find some source of support and encouragement along with these uh, verses this morning. Again, as I thought about this, um, this kind of thing sometimes happens, but the more I meditated upon these 12 verses, the more I saw the entire Bible in these 12 verses, which you might not see at first, but Lord willing, by the end, um, we will see. So again, our text Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 through 12. Let us pay heed to this word of God. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple south of the altar, Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east, and behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again he measured a thousand and he led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on one side and on the other. And he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh, and wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea, from Engedi to Enaglaim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Thus for the reading of the word of God, let us pray. Father, we come simply to know you more so that we might love you more so that we might be able be able to better proclaim your gospel to others help us see your truth as we continue in this examination of the vision that you brought to Ezekiel for Israel for us use it to encourage us to strengthen us, for us to see our hope in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Chapters 40 through 48, again, contain the final vision recorded by Ezekiel for the people of God. After the years of warning, the exile, the further prophetic words of this prophet and others, the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, Ezekiel receives this vision in the 25th year of their exile at the beginning of the year on the 10th day of the month in the 14th year after the city was struck down. Ezekiel receives this vision on that exact day. That date was given in the first chapter or the first verse of chapter 40 if you have forgotten or need the reference. And as most of you should recall, this date was the exact halfway point to the next year of Jubilee. So the people, again, most likely would have been thinking on this day of the fact that they were halfway to the Jubilee year, the year when people who had lost their land would have it returned, when slaves would be released, 
but a promised jubilee was no longer guaranteed uh, or no longer a reality for those in exile. But on this day, that day, the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. And by means of a vision, he takes Ezekiel to the land of Israel, to a city, to a very high mountain where there was a structure like a city, which was this temple complex that we have been looking at, a temple already constructed, a temple not asked to be built, but was already in existence. And thus, we began this examination of what God has done and is doing in simple form from this temple to redeem his people. We get a glimpse, or we have gotten a glimpse through this passage into the immensity, the majesty, the beauty, the precision, the completely holy character of this temple that God constructs, a temple not made by human hands, a temple where no corruption has existed, can exist, will exist, none will ever enter because of the safeguards constructed by God himself. A temple where the altar of sacrifice is in the exact center of the temple complex, as opposed to the previous physical temples that they had built, signifying the centrality of the once and only sacrifice of God himself to save his people. This vision of a temple which communicated hope to the Israelites in exile in a way that they could understand also communicates to us the hope that we have in all of its splendor and holiness and perfection because we know that the temple that God constructs is Jesus himself, if I can put it in those terms. All other temples simply signifying who Christ is. And we mentioned last week, and we will mention again, Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, in this new city, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth, there is no temple in that city. For the temple, we are told, is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And one last reminder, as we discussed previously, as some have called uh, these chapters the revelation of the Old Testament. What we have discussed in chapter 40 to 48 is the revelation of our Lord as we find in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Both Ezekiel and John in Revelation are respectively speaking to this revealing of this final promised land that Abraham was truly looking for as we uh, read in Hebrews chapter 11, verses nine and 10 we have in the past. Since Ezekiel's vision is communicating that same vision, of the final revelation that we have in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. What we have, again, is a temple that is uh, uh, not a temple that is going to be built for some supposed earthly millennial period, but it descends, as the book of Revelation tells us, after the millennium, which we are currently living in, as it has been waiting in eternity for its waters to flow forth for stones to be added to complete its construction by the addition of all the souls that God has chosen before the foundation of the world. And today we add to our understanding of this truth. With the end of chapter 46, we have completed the tour of the temple proper. The Lord brings Ezekiel back to the door of the temple and we will move to this land outside of the temple, which we will find is also very different than the land we know in the Middle East is Israel today. Uh, But that's next week, so we'll save that for next week. What we are going to see this morning as Ezekiel is brought back to this temple door, what Ezekiel sees that he apparently had not seen before is water issuing forth, trickling forth from below the temple threshold. And what Ezekiel is seeing and what we are going to see this morning is the truth that eternal life truly does flow from this eternal temple of God. And all that we have been witnessing in the details of this temple that we sometimes find to be too meticulous or too thorough or too uh, much uh, painstaking in detail, as we might say, what we have actually seen and heard is the good news 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For eternal life flows from this detailed, perfect, holy temple, which is a vision of nothing else, a symbol of nothing else other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. For he is the temple of Revelation 21, verse 22. Again, the main point here that we are conveying is that eternal life flows from this eternal, not temporary, but eternal temple of God constructed by God that will finally consummate and descend upon us in the new heaven and the new earth. As we look at these 12 verses, what we find uh, first is the data uh, that concerning uh, what becomes a river here in the first seven verses. We're given the source and the description of the river. And then in verses 8 through 12, we have the explanation of the significance of this river. And from both of these sections, we will find the truth again of what is happening is that this life-giving water is flowing out from this temple into this land. Just looking at these first seven verses in isolation, what we see is that we have this water that's bubbling up from under the threshold. The sense here is that water can be seen coming from the place where the bronze basin was in the Mosaic Temple, Exodus 30, verses 17 through 21. I'm going to repeat that. Where What we see is that water is coming from the place where this bronze basin was in the Mosaic Temple, Exodus 30, 17 through 21. I'm going to, it's going to be important in a minute. Then this water flows underground to the outside of the outer wall. And this would make sense with the idea that this temple again is on a very high mountain, a very high mountain. And this main sanctuary was three levels up. Go back and review for yourself, but it's three levels up uh, as we have seen steps going from the outer court to the inner court, from the inner court up and then up again to the sanctuary. So it would be flowing down uh, from this sanctuary. But again, this bronze basin, Hopefully you remember, as we, as we mentioned before, in this temple, uh, we find no bronze basin. We find no golden lampstand. We find no altar of incense, no Ark of the Covenant, no high priest, no anointing oil, no veil separating the Holy of Holies. This is not the temple that Israel had been building or would build. What do we know? We know that the lampstand was to provide light. It's not there. The bronze basin was for washing and purification. It's not there. The altar of incense was a symbol of of, uh, intercession, of prayer between God and his people. The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. The veil represents the separation of of holy from common, from heaven, uh, between heaven and earth. And what do we find now here? That's gone. But the glory of the Lord fills the temple. And what we find is that this water is flowing from where the bronze basin would have been. What was the bronze basin used for? It was used for purification. It held water for purification or cleansing of the priests. That water's still there. It's still providing cleansing and purification. But it's doing, for it, doing it for a priesthood of believers as it's flowing forth from the sanctuary and is bringing cleansing to the land. We'll return to this point later. But again, the immediate context is that this water starts as a trickle. It flows outward from the temple at the southern end of the eastern wall. And this man like bronze that has been a guide and has been measuring for Ezekiel begins to measure again. He measures eastward a thousand cubits, which is approximately a third of a mile, and the water is ankle deep. He goes another third of a mile, and it reaches the knees. Another third of a mile, it's to his waist. Another third of a mile, and the water is no longer passable. And then we have the question posed by the guide to Ezekiel. Have you seen this? Son of man, have you seen this? This is for emphasis. This water means something. This growth of the size of the water means something. The cleansing property of this water means something. Do you see, son of man? 
Remember that Ezekiel had been told at least twice in, twice in his vision to look with his eyes and to hear with his ears and to set his heart on all that God was going to show him and then declare that to the house of Israel. And so the emphasis, have you seen this, Ezekiel? Do you see this, son of man? Do you understand? And then once Ezekiel makes it to the bank of the river, he notices the trees on both sides of the river. Uh, With that, we have the physical description and the introduction uh, to the water coming from the temple. That's the immediate context of what Ezekiel has seen. But then the man is going to ensure that Ezekiel has some understanding of what this does mean. In the second section, Ezekiel is told that these waters are flowing to the east. They go down through the Arabah into the sea, and when they enter the sea, the sea will become fresh. Or, another word that could be used there is healed. This, uh, for for the Israelites, would be indicating the the Dead Sea. The Hebrew here, though, indicates the, uh, the stagnant and filthy nature of the waters that this water is flowing into. But not only this sea, but everywhere this river enters, it will make fresh or clean or healed. The animals will be able to thrive because they can drink of these fresh waters. Fish will thrive and increase in number. Fishermen will be able to use this water again. All kinds of trees will grow again. They will bear fresh fruit every month. Leaves will not uh, Wither, fruit will not fall. Why? Because their water comes from the sanctuary and their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. I skipped a verse. There is a verse that leaves the swamps and the marshes for salt. There are some interesting interpretations that get thrown around um, of why the swamps and marshes were left. No need. The simplest answer is usually the best. God created salt too. He's not trying to get rid of all salt. Again, I would point you towards Mark 9, 9, where Jesus says salt is good. It has its purpose. Salt water fish need the salt water creatures have their, salt water creatures have their habitat as well. And the Hebrew word there even used for salt indicates more than salt, but it carries with with it this larger range of chemicals that are found and are important resources that can be used. And so it's left. Uh, But in the immediate land surrounding the temple, it's going to be made fresh. It's going to be clean. It's going to be completely healed as it can be translated. And let me interject here again and say, this cannot possibly describe a temporal millennial period where this temple is established And then the laws of nature would have to be broken for this fruit to produce every month. In Genesis chapter 8, what does God do in Genesis chapter 8? What's in Genesis chapter 8? It's the covenant that God made with Noah. And what does he tell Noah? What does he tell all mankind in this covenant? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Is he going to cease the seasons so that this fruit can come up once a month? Leaves will not wither. God is not going to break his covenant that he made with Noah and with mankind. Again, this temple, this living water is pointing to an eternal promise that is being worked out in heaven Make it on earth as it is in heaven and comes with the new heaven and the new earth. We can turn to Revelation 21 now and I would invite you to do that and we can see. Do you see? Have you seen this? Let's find it in Revelation 21. Beginning Beginning in verse one, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride and adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Now turn to verse, or chapter 22. And let's read the first three verses. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. In Ezekiel, we are witnessing what will be repeated by John. But we have a more full picture of what God has done and continues to do because of the revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This information in Revelation is not new. It is just missed until Christ, our great high priest, the final uh, revelation, the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, the true temple came. And John said in his gospel, in John chapter one, verse 14, the word became flesh and he did what? He tabernacled among us. He tabernacled among us. But this began from the beginning. This truth is in creation. So take your mind and wipe it clean for a moment and go to Genesis chapter, not in the Bible. You can just, Genesis chapter one, verse one. You know what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the spirit of God hovered over what? The face of the waters. God created the earth and on this earth he created a garden, the Garden of Eden. And what does that mean? What does the Garden of Eden mean? Well, Eden means what? Paradise. And the garden served as what? The original temple, the place where God would meet with his people. So the Garden of Eden was the temple of paradise in this creation of earth at the beginning. And what else was going on in the Garden of Eden? There was a tree of life in the middle of this garden. And there was a river. And what did it do? It flowed out of the garden and it divided out into four rivers into the land. And man was put there to tend this garden temple to eat of the trees that provided life except for the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then man was to go forth and be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and take dominion over this earth from this garden temple of paradise. Man was to spread out across the earth and be God's representative on earth with this garden temple complex, the garden of Eden as our place to come and meet with our great God. But Adam sinned. He did not obey He did what he was not supposed to do and brought man into the state of sin and brought the world under the curse. But God, in his mercy, according to his purpose, the purpose of his his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, God determined to have a people in spite of our sin. And so the water continues to flow. The living waters continue to flow. Paradise will exist again in the new heaven and the new earth that was once and what was once found at the beginning in the state of innocency will be again even greater for the temple itself, not made with hands, but it is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb himself. This is the message of Scripture The gospel is the good news of the kingdom of God that is near, that is here, that is coming. This new heaven and this new earth that is being built up in the temple that is our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. And he's going to descend. And it is going to descend in all its glory at the last day. And God has pointed to this reality since creation, since he built this world and put a garden temple as its center where he could meet with us. This is not often thought of, but I would make the case as well that when Cain and Abel uh, brought their sacrifice to the Lord, we don't think about this. And again, people have made the case, but where were they sacrificing? Cain and Abel were bringing their sacrifices outside the gates of Eden. Adam and Eve knew where it was. Their children would have known what it was. What was the whole purpose of man after we were cast out of the garden? We want to try to find a way to get back in the presence of God. He's cast us out. And so the whole reason for sacrifice that they had been taught by their parents, Adam and Eve, is because we want to be back in his presence, back into paradise with God. And so they would get as close as they would get, could get outside of Eden and offer their sacrifice to where God was in their minds. That access to God was destroyed with the flood. Couldn't find that anymore. And after the flood, man decided to do what? Well, we'll build our own tower. We'll find our own way to heaven. And we know that the Lord didn't allow that foolishness to last. And what man was failing to realize was that they could not, we cannot make our own way to God. God provides the way. God provides the temple. God provides the living water. He provides the salvation. He provides the sanctification. He provides the healing. It's not us. All we are are fallen creatures in need of his mercy and this truth. Psalm chapter 46, verse four, called the Israelites to remember God is our fortress. Some of you will know this. We sing this, Psalm 46. God is our fortress. He's our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in trouble. We will not fear though the earth gives way. I hope this is resonating with you. You know this. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Why? Why is all that true? Psalm 46 says, because there's a river. Because there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, describes Zion as the place where the Lord is in his majesty for us and it is a place of broad rivers and streams but where no ships can pass for the Lord is the judge there and the lawgiver and the king and they will not pass. Joel chapter three is often referred to in relation to Ezekiel 47. Let me try to turn there. Joel chapter three, verses 17 and 18. This is what Joel records. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy and strangers shall never again pass through it. In that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13, after writing of the sins of Judah, that's Jeremiah 17, 13, Jeremiah writes of the sins of Judah. Jeremiah writes that Yahweh, the Lord, is the hope of Israel. All those who forsake him will be put to shame. They'll be written into the earth. That means they'll be forgotten because they have forsaken the Lord and the Lord is the fountain of living water. Israel had knowledge. They had some understanding. Zechariah 14, which speaks of the coming day of the Lord, the final day, not a day before a millennium, but on that great and final day of the Lord, after the millennium, after the Lord has gone out against the nations lined up against him, the Lord returns and stands upon the earth 
verse 4, there, it will be a unique day, Zechariah writes. And in verse 8, on that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem. Especially in this verse from Zechariah, we begin to understand that the Lord, who is our temple, is where all of our blessings come from. In Jesus' victory from eternity, we find our blessings in the temple who has existed from eternity, who temporarily did tabernacle with mankind so that he could provide the salvation and blessing for his people. And he will return again to establish his garden temple paradise forever on the new earth. And we need to, we need to see this in the living water that has always poured forth from this temple of God. Eternally from our God, symbolized physically throughout creation as God has ministered to us with this truth that we don't restore the earth. We don't rescue the earth from some fallen state. God does. God is our salvation. He is our rescuer because he is the water of life that brings new life to barren waters and land. We find this truth in parables that Jesus told, this living water flowing forth compared to the parable of the mustard seed or the parable of leaven in Matthew chapter 13 in three verses, 31, 32, and 33. Israel was waiting for a Messiah. He was coming and then he was there and he's gone up but he's going to return. We desire a temple. We have a temple. That temple is Christ. We are being built up to him. He is the chief cornerstone. We are built upon that cornerstone. And there is living water that flows from this temple. And Jesus tells us where this water comes from. These are the verses that some of you have been waiting for. Jesus says in John chapter four to the woman at the well, in verse 13, whoever drinks of this well water is going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give will never be thirsty again uh, forever. For the water that I give will in him become a spring of water welling up unto eternal life. In John chapter 7, beginning in verse 37, Jesus cries out to the crowd. It's the end of the feast and he cries out on the last day and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then the text goes on to say in verse 39, now this Jesus said about the spirit to those who believed in him were to receive for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not glorified. So here we let scripture interpret scripture, my friends. What is this living water? It is the Holy Spirit of our God. How is the spirit, the third person of the Trinity, described for us finite creatures as proceeding from the Father and the Son? What are we seeing in Ezekiel and Revelation and other passages in Scripture? The living water flowing forth from the temple to heal the world. The Holy Spirit pouring out and all this being consummated on that great day. Again, for the Israelite, there is a greater amount of shadow than we have in this vision of Ezekiel. But they could have some understanding from the symbols that they knew all this talk of water and the Lord again came from the beginning. They knew the garden of Eden. They knew that the Lord was water, living water from the garden. But man lost that presence of God. We find it again flowing from our savior, Jesus Christ, as it proceeds from this eternal temple in the Holy Spirit. And it flows today. And it's coming in all its fullness on that great day. But you have access to it even now. 
What Ezekiel is describing is that eternal life flows from this eternal temple. And that's the only place that it flows from. It always has. It always will. We have been more and less aware of this truth as people and as individuals throughout history, throughout our own lives. But our awareness of this truth doesn't change the truth of the matter. Write down what you see, Ezekiel. Tell the people what you see, Ezekiel. Brothers and sisters, write down what you see. Tell the people what you see. God made a covenant in eternity that he was going to have a people in union with him forever. And it is realized in the person and work of Jesus Christ who is symbolized in various ways in Scripture in various ways to overcome our dullness of mind, our dullness of heart, but maybe in no more of a significant way than in this presentation of his presence with his people forever through this garden, tabernacle, temple, symbol of God that finds its truth in eternity, but is being worked out by his spirit in time and space, even right now in this room, As we speak, that living water is flowing through this room in you. If you are Christ, this vision is more. It's so much more than pointing to some temporary lodging place of God in some time period before his final judgment. This vision is the end. It is the telos. It is the purpose of. God is bringing creation to its consummation where we are part of this new heaven and new earth. This temple and this city we are a part of and it will descend with its life-giving waters flowing for our cleansing forever in the new earth. God is so much greater than we imagine but we can imagine a little bit greater than we do when we read scripture as we ought because he has given us the sanctified means to do it by scripture. Get rid of the foolishness that is taught. Hear God's word. Let scripture interpret scripture. Let Ezekiel 47 and Revelation 21 and 22, Ezekiel 40 to 48 and Revelation 21 and 22 fill you with joy for the purpose of God and what he is doing. Revelation 21, again, we have the fulfillment of much of this language that we have seen. I read a little bit before. Let me return. I want to read a little bit more. And I saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away and he who was seated on the throne said behold I am making all things new also he said write this down for these words are trustworthy and true and he said to me it is done I am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. In the 6th century BC, Israel needed hope after the destruction of the temple. And so they received that hope in this vision that told them that there was another temple coming with life-giving water and they needed to put their hope in this truth from the word of God through Ezekiel. That hope has come in Jesus Christ. The true temple has come and tabernacled among us. And then he was put to death. But death did not destroy that temple. That temple 
destroyed death. And now Jesus is called the cornerstone of this great city and temple that we are also a part of as stones, as vessels, as springs of living water filled with the Holy Spirit if we are in Christ. Have you seen this? Have you seen it? Write it down. Live by it. Share it with others. Amen. Let's pray.